understand this crisis, I need to learn about Sri Lanka's past history, about the country's cultural background. We had our own kingdom. The Sinhalese had their own kingdom. But most of the time, one kingdom rules the whole country. And between 12, 15 and 14, 69 or something, the Tamil kingdom, which ruled the whole country, and there was a bit of a lapse before the uh, Portuguese came in in 1505, uh, when the Sinhalese kingdom was the main ruler in the south. But still, we had our own king uh, in Jaffna, and also the uh, principalities around in Vatikalo and Vavonia, uh, or we call it Vanni. But anyway, in 1505, uh, Portuguese came. At that time, in Colombo there was a Sinhalese kingdom, and in Jaffna there was a Tamil kingdom, and in the central part of Sri Lanka, which is called, uh, I mean, which is an upcountry, a uh, hilly area, and uh, Kandy is the town there. So uh, there was another kingdom there, and Kandy was the one controlling the eastern part of Sri Lanka. So naturally, the Jaffna kingdom was purely Tamils, the Colombo kingdom was purely Sinhalese, and the Candian kingdom was Tamils and Sinhalese. Then in 1796, British came. They captured they all from the Dutch. They were trying to capture the Candian kingdom, and in 1815, they captured the Candian kingdom. And uh, so in 1815, the entire island was under British. And in 1833 he amalgamated the Sinhalese areas and Tamil areas as one country. And that was the basic, I would say, the very first, the seed of our problem. When we got independence, even though we are two nations, two separate kingdoms in a way, and uh, we became the minority under the umbrella of independence or democracy. So within the parliament, they are 70 percent, we were 30 percent. So we have this democracy, electoral democracy, majority wins. So the first prime minister, 79 percent, look, the British have taken the lands away from the peasantry. We must do something about that. And in his mind also was these plantation workers came from India in the 19th century. They are really foreigners. We must send them back. So two things happen. And the myth grew because the plantation estates, tea estates, were where a lot of the agricultural land was. The myth grew not that the British had taken the land, but the Indian Tamil worker, the plantation workers, had taken the Sinhalese land. Mm. So he did two things, kill two birds with one stone. He decitizenized the plantation workers, or refused them citizenship in the future. And he began uh, an agricultural scheme in the Northeast to settle singular people. It's very important to understand that. That was the beginning of demographic changes, which later become, comes to the Eastern province. Demographic changes and decitizenization. First discrimination. In 1956, uh, a person not directly in line of succession, S. W. R. Dibandar Nayaka, who was a, a, a poorer relative, so to speak, he thought the best way of getting power quickly, because he was not going to succeed the dynasties mm -hmm. in a hurry, quickly was to get the electorate on his side with Sinhalese as a language, o official language, Buddhism as a state religion. Naturally, the question arose of uh, national language superseding English as the official language of the country. Sinhalese, we decided upon as the official language because 70% of the people of Ceylon are Sinhalese. At the same time, we naturally re realized that uh, the Tamil minority 
language that was also old, a very rich language in literature and so on. And therefore we decided also to give a reasonable use to the Tamil language as a language of a national minority. He said we will have reasonable use of Tamil because he didn't want, he was still trying to be nice. Mm. And that is when the Buddhist priest said, no, no reasonable use of Tamil. We won't have it. And they gathered before his house and persuaded him not, so he related and said, okay, no reasonable use of Tamil. But that didn't save him from the, from the monk's bullet. So he was assassinated. So we have the monks coming into power, bringing the army and the police against the Tamils from then on. Right. And any time that there are a Tamil protests or Tamil this thing, they let go, not so much the army, as the unofficial army, the thugs, the gundas. Each minister had his own private army. In 1958, there were more than 3,000 people lost their lives and over 20,000 displaced from the south and they were all shipped to the, their homeland called North and East. Legislations passed to prevent people getting into um, civil service, into university education, and the university people who couldn't get in, there was a discrimination on the marks first, and still they found there was a gap between the Tamils and Sinhalese. The Tamil had to score about 50 marks more than the Tamil Sinhalese to get into the university. Still they found there were too many Tamils getting in, so they brought in region by province by province. So many people can come in only from these provinces.